Hello, Story Seekers. I'm Ben. I'm Nico, and you're listening to The Tiny Bookcase. Joining us, we have a writer who is fueled by her love of people watching. She's the author of Dark Flowers, Wired, and Among the Hunted, book one in her upcoming Skyglass series. We'd like to welcome Caitlin Brooke. Hello, Caitlin. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Yes, of course. You're um, New York time, right? Oh, yes. I'm so sorry, you guys. It's like after lunch for you. <laughs> Oh yeah, it's fine. It's we're, we're like three in the afternoon. We, um, we did have a moment though because um, uh, the uh, the clocks just went forwards in the UK. So oh, we were like, we were like, what's what time are we recording today? <laughs> it's always such a nasty surprise. <laughs> yes. Ah, uh, yes. But um, I was very glad to have you on. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Your books sound absolutely fascinating. The uh, Among the Hunted has lots of. Uh, sort of greek references right like uh, mythology. yes yes how did you and how did you go with that? so i've always loved you know the, the different gods goddesses but as i was looking to write a story about them all of the you know the most powerful immortals with like zeus poseidon um they've already their stories have already been told and i was very inspired by madeline miller and i read her book circe and reading about it, I think it was from the Odyssey, where Circe just had this little one-line part where Odysseus went to her island for, for the night, and she turned his crew into pigs. And yeah. from, from that one little section, from, from that book, Alan Miller was able to create this, this entire novel and, and this whole new like universe, but still going off of myth so i wanted to also take like the lesser known characters and give them a voice and see what they would do so i focused on the nymphs and i just i am in love with them because i think they are they have more power than you know greek mythology has let on usually they're just you know these little background groupies for all the gods and <laughs> They don't. <laughs> they, they don't do anything, you know. Yeah. So yeah. I did all this research, and you know, there's so many different kinds. You have the water naiads, the the dryads who you know influence the forests. There's um, orais and they're wind nymphs, and and thusais, they're the earthen nymphs. So I created my own little world where it's like their sanctuary away from the rest of the the gods and the immortals and it actually gave them a purpose and a voice and just invited readers to see what their daily life was actually like it's a it's a really cool concept it's, yeah Thank it's so you. nice to see so you see the threads get pulled on on classical concepts like that it's such a cool thing to do especially because they are in, inherently timeless as as stories oh absolutely so, mm -hmm. so to give them a new spin is is a really fun thing to do and necessary and, almost to sort of keep them updated yes because we need to see like i don't like that they're just you know these objects for the, the gods to use as they want like there's they need more of a purpose and i'm sure they have one and they just no one has told their story before so i'm planting my flag <laughs> excellent excellent taking me in a weird direction but i'd really like in that vein, someone's got to write a book that's sort of detailing the histories of all of these skeletons that necromancers keep finding and raising. <laughs> Just Ooh. conveniently located, undead. That's, that would be you know, cool. The, the three skeletons in Jason and the Argonauts. I want a spin-off movie about them. Yes. Instead of doing like the same thing over and over again, like let's let's explore more. There's so much. There's so much material there. Of course, it would be really unsettling if they were actually really content. You know, they were a bit, bit sort of jobs worthy about it. Like, yeah, well, of, course, of course, we've got to go toe to toe with these guys. Somebody has to. Right. <laughs> They're jealous of the fre of the uh, flesh prisons that they still walk around in. Oh, Galen flesh prisons! Skeleton's duty to protect his land. <laughs> <laughs> 
There's great benefits of being a uh, necromancer's uh, draugr. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Right, okay. Well, Nico is going to be uh, telling us the story first today. Um, the prompt for it is actually directly lifted from your book title, which is Among the Hunted. So we've gone for the prompt, quite simply, The Hunted. Um, so uh, we'll be having Nick telling the story first, we'll have a bit of a chat about it, and then we'll be getting an excerpt from you, Caitlin. So without Great. further ado, Nico, are you ready? Oh, I am. <laughs> The Hunted. Ha, peggy, wake it, whoa! The voice rang through the woods. The rich, Etonian tones of an educated voice, distorted into a childlike caterwauling. Ha, peggy, wake it, whoa! The vowels extended like the body of a loathsome caterpillar the hairs of displeasure bristling on its wriggling green back. Politics, Adrian decided, were probably not for him. He'd spent so much of his adult life convincing people that politics were for him, and that being born on a council estate in South London shouldn't preclude one from a £25 lunch allowance and the opportunity to sleep on an antique wooden bench now and again. Should it? He had worked hard. He'd gone to a good university, in spite of going to a shit secondary school. He had groomed and preened, practised his smile, curbed his accent until he lost the twang of marketplace his father had left in him. He had walked the tightrope between man of the people, who knew how to bag up his strawberries because he'd been doing it since he was a lad, and man of refinement, who could stand his own in a debate and identify the constituent parts of an artisanal cheese board at 50 metres. His campaign for a brighter Brixton had lifted him into the public eye, and his caustic words for the Conservative representative present had earned him the interest of the other parties. No one had, publicly at least, called an MP a swine and come out looking so... effortlessly cool. Now, as the slim branches of the undergrowth snagged at his hair and their barbs caught in his exposed skin... Adrian considered that maybe, when you're going in to swim with the big fishes, there's a reason they normally hide you in a cage. He had enjoyed, at the time, the public support he picked up from poking fun at the MPs. I should run next election, he had joked, in that way that someone who's desperate to be told, oh, you should, you know, jokes about things. And they did. The people who knew Adrian as the boy whose father sold fruit on the market who said that he was one of them, well, that they inflated his ego and pushed the boy to greater heights. The sad thing about an ego is that it is terribly easy to inflate, but extremely difficult to let out the air once it's in. You can deflate the thing completely, yes, but in many ways that is worse, and its owner will start pumping anything they can in to try and save face, then you end up with egos full of all sorts of dreadful nonsense. But we digress. Uh, the ego, in its inflated form, starts pushing other things out of the way to make room for itself. Things like uh, not being an obnoxious twat at parties, uh, having the wherewithal to check over your shoulder for the skulking, dagger-wielding types. And Adrian had stopped checking over his shoulder. He only looked down at where he'd begun to feel everyone else belonged. So he hadn't hesitated when he was, quite out of the blue, invited to a gala luncheon by the Conservative Party, in a letter that contained lots of phrases like a keen interest in your decision to enter the political sphere and surprising underdog. A pair of phrases that anyone with a keen eye will discern actually mean Get your nose out of our business, you little upstart, or I'll have my butler kick your noggin in. He had gone, alone, to the address on the invite, and instead of thinking sensible things like, isn't it quiet here, and why aren't there any other cars, he had instead thought, crikey, I'm bloody quids in here, look how fucking exclusive this party must be. But in the here and now as the shrilling chirp of the aristocrat tugs at his ears, 
Adrian rued his decisions. His deflated ego flapped behind him like a cape, a great hole rent in the bubble of self-worth. Help! Adrian screamed. A long, desperate scream. He felt the fresh scars at his throat bulge as he did. The folds of meat that were no longer there strained to move. Phantom words formed in his voice. But instead, the wind just ploughed over his tongue, raw and dangerous, flecked with blood. What he meant to say was, please, please, God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, don't kill me. But instead, all he could do was scream. He heard the crashes of horses moving through wooded undergrowth. His cry, a beacon to the hunters. I have you, piggy, wiggy, whoa. Adrian willed himself to run faster and reflected for a moment on how much he missed his feet. The mockery of toes they'd made in the stump of his thigh burned horribly as they pounded against the dirt. The stitching really was masterful. Even a man in his position could accept that, surely. The Armines had been tailoring for the family for generations now, he'd been told, when they were prepping him for the hunt. They cut a damn fine suit, and so much more. The Armine man had ignored his pleas for assistance in escaping the situation. Adrian couldn't read the fellow at all, even as he began his bizarre work. He slit the bridge of Andrew's nose. It was a crack as he removed a bone, expertly sliced away tissue from cartilage until the nose could be pushed up flat against his face. The nostrils flared in permanent indignity. Andrew could only weep. The drugs they'd given him were so especially cruel. To be awake and feel all the things that happened to you while unable to, to move or cry out. Well, that took an expertise in medicine that would rival our minds tailoring. And so it was, with his gaze fixed upon a large and grotesquely detailed anatomical drawing labelled Homo Porcus, that Adrian had felt himself be ruined, so perfectly expertly as to defy reason. He had to stop, he knew. The stitching was opening on so many of his joints, and there was no wind left in him to run with. Defeated, dejected and destroyed, Adrian allowed himself to come to a stop on his, well, he supposed he ought to call them trotters. He was right about politics, he thought. It was not for him. He thought about fruit stalls as the first hounds caught up with him. Got you, Peggy, Wiggy, whoa. That was that was disgusting, <laughs> and I loved it. It was amazing. <laughs> I was. It was actually like the 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 construction of the human into the Homo porcus yes. was vomit was vomit inducingly horrific. Um, I wrote that it was elegantly grotesque. grotesque. It was, it, it was so, just you know, by the book mechanical almost in the description, but. The way, with the description, it was just so, like you were saying, just nasty and just raw. And it, the, the, the juxtaposition of those two was just phenomenal. <laughs> really fun. Um, oh, I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. Yeah, it's, it's very uh, fun. Yeah. It's a weird story. The, the class traitor stuff was fantastic. Yeah. Um, and that's, the, there was a, the, the moment when you sort of identified the the kind of uh, you know the working class man that's or working class roots man who's sort of uh, you know aspired to be elitist yeah uh, like you could point to so many british politicians that have done that yeah 
Um, and yeah, it was borderline uncomfortable. And then you made it, and then that just paled in comparison when you realize that they've turned this man into a pig. Ugh. It was, oh my goodness. I loved it because the message, you know, we're all trying to hide who we really are. And with him trying to, you know, fit in with these people, you see it in, in so many, you know, books and TV shows and just real life. And then they actually flipped around on him. And yeah, he's trying to transform himself, but then they physically transform him into what they want him to be what they think he really is and I just I thought it was so cool I loved all of your prose I thought it was just amazing it the imagery that you that you created I, I wrote down a couple different phrases I loved twang of marketplace I thought that was really great um how you described the inflation and deflation of the ego and you know the struggles between those um, I loved how the ego flapped behind him like a cape. I just thought, oh my goodness. It really reminded me of once it really started to get going, um, the most dangerous game, how they they hunt the the humans, like the, the wealthy elitists hunt the humans under yeah. the guise of inviting them for the dinner party, but, but they're the dinner. <laughs> I thought that was really cool. Also reminded me very strongly of Tusk. Yeah, I, it wasn't until I stopped writing, I thought I, I've just written Tusk, haven't I? <laughs> um, which is a uh, Kevin Smith movie uh, involving, oh. <laughs> um, uh, involving a walrus um, in a similar sort of scenario. <laughs> well, I say walrus. Yeah. Um, it's it's but, equally uh, grim. It, it's, yes, wow. equally grim. And but, yeah. but I think there was... But you didn't lift Tusk. Like, this is its own thing. Like, all of yeah. the... The class and the political elements and the yeah, all that stuff is um, quite distinct. It also reminded me a bit. I was like a, almost like a companion piece to the. Do you remember? I think it was in season one. I I wrote that story about the the London boy Dan Good becoming the prime minister's aide. So I'm not kidding. Yeah, this was for me part of like tiny bookcase canon. Oh, because really? when I was coming up with the concept, I didn't name the politicians because we never named the prime minister. <laughs> and I oh, thought that's, that's a really cool. fun thing to carry over. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Um, it, I yeah, will but... also say that in the what? intro, when uh, when Kelly said, oh, and they, they all got turned into pigs, I was like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> yes, yes, of course. That's, oh, oh. my goodness. I really like, I don't know if you guys have read this book. It's called The Motion of Puppets by Keith Donahue. It's a great title, but no, I haven't read that. Oh, it was it was, it was a really, really great story. And in it, when you were describing when he's, you know, watching himself and feeling himself being turned into the pig, you know, with like the loose stitching. And um, in that book, Motion of Puppets, this woman is turned into a puppet and she's just lying on the table and you know same thing like she didn't know what drug they gave her but they're like taking out her insides and they're filling her with sawdust and she just feels like the rhythmic thudding and padding of being stuffed with the sawdust and how her limbs just she can't she can't she doesn't have any control over them anymore and I thought that was a, a really cool parallel to see Yours was a little bit more. <laughs> Hers was a little bit more muted, but I I absolutely loved it. That's wicked. That sounds yeah. horrible, and I yeah, am that... actually definitely going to read it. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was I I loved loved that book. <laughs> um. So uh, I hope I hope you're not offended by what he did with the prompt, considering it comes from the title of your book. Oh um, no. But uh, it was uh, that was that was excellent stuff, Nick. Nice nice work. Thank you very much. Um. um uh, are you ready to read us an excerpt from uh, your novel, Caitlin? I am. I don't think I can follow that though. It was so. It was so good. <laughs> <laughs> you flatter me. You're going to be fine. <laughs> it was wonderful. <laughs> All right. So this is an excerpt from my dark fantasy adventure story, uh, Among the Hunted. Sorry, I'm waiting for someone. Kate said, dodging the siren's touch as she reached for her hand. Waiting for who? Zeus? Have you seen him? Not lately. What are you doing together? I thought you stayed in your own little circles. 
though you're missing out on being sequestered from the gods. Poseidon is delicious. The way he makes me squeal. She giggled with delight. How's his brother? Kate shook her head. He's a demon. I would never lie with him. He raped my sister. Now my other sister is in danger of the same fate. This is the only way I can keep her from harm. By sacrificing yourself? More or less? Kate clenched her teeth. Well, seems like you're already hunting then. I'll leave you to it. I'm going to introduce myself to those fine looking morsels. I, I mean, mortals. <laughs> Playing volleyball down there. Kate grimaced. Part of her wanted to protect the unsuspecting humans, but the other part was terrified of the siren. Pessino snapped her head to the right, scanning the lush jungle a few yards behind them. Kate followed the siren's gaze. What? Just the trees. I thought I... S <gasps> she gasped. A solid thunk sounded as a scream whistled from beyond the trees. What was that? Kate's skin crawled with unease. Frantic movement caught her eye. Several hundred yards down the beach, a human girl emerged from the tree-lined path. She was running, no, sprinting toward Kate. Tears poured from her eyes. Kate glanced behind her but saw no pursuer. That's when she realized the girl was shouting. But Kate couldn't hear her over the crashing waves. Pesano, do you see this? Kate pointed. The siren remained silent. She spun around to face her. Can you hear? Oh my goddess! Tears sprung to her violet eyes. A sleek, black quill protruded from the base of Pesano's throat. Her wand's lively eyes were clouded and shiny with death. Her skin was the color of a dead fish. A fountain of blood bubbled over the siren's bottom lip, running down her chin and splattering her neck like tribal war paint. Kate fanned her hands. She aimed to help, to lay her down at least. But the other end of the lengthy quill was buried in the sand forcing her to remain upright. Kate's head swiveled, trying to locate the beast that shot the quill. It could only be one animal. She had to move. Several cries erupted in Kate's ears as her adrenaline kicked in, heightening her senses. Down the beach, the few other humans fled, running for cover in the thick jungle. She turned back to the sprinting girl. A gathering sandstorm nipped at her heels. Kate took a step to the right just as another quill sailed through the sky the poisoned tip biting into the sand inches from her foot. The girl's cries reached her ears. Run! The girl shrieked as a sudden torrent of lethal quills rained down around them, puncturing the picturesque paradise. Silver claws extended from the swirling sand behind the girl, hooked into her back and yanked her to the ground. A ferocious growl erupted as the beast tore into her, ending her life. Raising its menacing mustard eyes to Kate, the Perial licked its blood-stained muzzle. Its lips pulled back in a snarl. Calf! Kate breathed. This wasn't the plan. No one was supposed to die. Why would he unleash the Perial in plain sight? Why attack humans? What was Zeus thinking? The wind roiled around her, tugging and pushing her to change. He was growing even more careless, frantic to claim her. As if he could hear the wind coaxing her, the Perial hissed, its lips pulling farther back to reveal dagger-like teeth. Kate listened to her element. She leapt into the wind, her flesh disappearing, and directed the salty breeze into the humid jungle encroaching on the white sand. She didn't look back, hurtling herself through the thick foliage, twisting and rolling through the vivid flora. But the Perial wasn't an easy hunter to flee. They never lost a quarry. That's why the gods turned them loose. They were the ultimate weapon. Kate pushed herself through the heavy air as fast as she could, but there was too much humidity. She could feel the perial catching up, feel his breath on the wind's tendrils surrounding her. But in the air, at least she stood half a chance, just a little farther. Bursting through the dark canopy of leaves, she raced on, her target shining like a beacon, calling her to safety. Death cried out as the perial killed another unlucky human to cross its path. Their final breaths carried on the wind, whispers filling her mind. Kate mourned their pain, held their anguish, and tasted their sorrow. She was the common thread linking their deaths. She killed them all. Kate pushed the fevered whispers from her thoughts. She spiraled down beneath the tree's shady leaves. 
The network of portals that connected the human realm rippled just beyond the next tree. If she could reach it, she might be able to lose the Perial. The muggy air seemed to hang stagnant, as, as sticky and immovable as honey. Kate's breaths came out in short gasps as she strove forward, pushing the breeze harder. From far away, another snarl rattled her teeth. A shiver gripped her spine. The air split apart and a loosed quill found its mark, slicing into her side like a toxic needle. In the same breath, she fell from the sky, the toxin in the quill immobilizing her elemental connection. Kate wheezed as her chest smashed against the damp earth, and all the air in her lungs was forced out between her teeth. She spared a quick look at her side and gritted her teeth, feeling the poison enter her bloodstream. She had to remove it. She didn't know what would happen if enough toxin filled her heart. If only Zeus were kind enough to let her die. Inhaling sharply, Kate wrapped her hand around the sleek quill and jerked it upward, screaming as it slid out of her flesh. Scarlet blood pulsed from the wound, soaking the thin material of her dress in seconds. She squeezed her eyes shut against the brilliant pain. A throaty growl echoed close by as the pounding of swift feet caused the dirt beneath her palms to tremble. She had to get up. Pressing her filthy hand to her side to staunch the flow of blood, Kate rose unsteadily. Sweat pulsed down her face as she stumbled through the unforgiving jungle toward escape. Before her, a giant leaf split in two as another quill rent the air. The smell of blood and dirt made her head swim. The desire to lie down and float away was overwhelming, but she couldn't give up, couldn't let him win. A string of tears fell down Kate's cheeks as she made her feet take a few more steps. She was almost there. The imperial rasped right behind her. The heat of his breath grazed her calves. Searing pain engulfed her as the animal raked her skin with its claws, shredding her flesh. She stumbled to the right, but a powerful hit from a large paw sent her sprawling forward instead. Kate collapsed over a moss-covered rock. Her neck snapped with the momentum. With blurring vision, she turned her head, waiting for the imperial to deliver the final blow, when she slipped and fell through the cool air as if she had leapt from the top of a towering tree. A pair of solid arms caught her, cradling her petite frame against a muscled torso. Right on time, my sweet. Rest now. You'll need all your strength. The deep voice whispered as the pain capsized, claiming her consciousness. The pace on that. Loved it. <laughs> it was like a, it was like a gallop. It was like a gallop. I loved it. Yeah, man. I, I, I really like that kind of writing where it's just, it, you, you feel the breathlessness of the chase. Yeah, I think <laughs> everything in how it's constructed as well, like the, the, the sentences have to be so rapid fire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you, you keep the pace up for the whole thing, which is whilst so keeping hard to do. <laughs> yeah, very hard, especially whilst keeping description flowing so that you so that you feel like you know you've got a sense of place and you know what look what it looks like, what it feels like, what it tastes like. Mm -hmm. Everything. Like um I love the way that you use colour initially as like um uh, as like how to um describe shifts in what's happening so yes. the the siren post post death with you know the fish like quality of the skin the uh the mustard eyes and the silver claws of the beast um yeah fantastic really a lot that was a very fun and also you know exhilarating and exciting which is she wrote something down about the siren's death and it was the the being forced to remain upright by the quill Yes, because yeah. that was absolutely horrid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just that that moment when uh, just the description of you know trying to remove it and or trying to it was trying to lay her down, wasn't it? And then yeah. so again, oh no, I can't can't do that because there's a <laughs> a massive spike in the way, and it, it all of a sudden it was oh this wasn't like a like a dart or an arrow. This thing is this is a big thing. Whatever this is. Yes. And it made the, the threat suddenly so much worse. And that threat is quite grounded by that, isn't it? It's like, oh, this thing is throwing these massive quills. And but also you had stuff like the the humidity affecting the way of the the, the path of the flight. Yeah. Um, like stuff like that where it's they're not just flitting around in some kind of magical haze. Mm -hmm. That there are mundane forces affect what's happening. Which make yes. the whole thing feel very real, despite the the magical and mythological aspect of it. Um, very cool, yeah. Thank and, and you. In terms of the excerpt itself, like to open with this um, 
very strong statement about uh, Zeus and uh, the rape that he's perpetrated. Mm-hmm. And um, the way that you... The, what, as soon as, I knew we were going to have a good time when you said... <laughs> When, when you said he's a demon and you put so much force into it in your voice and that I, it, you know, it was, it was really well told is my point here. Um, Cause I felt, I felt very much like I would, I, I knew how angry she was from the way that you told the story, which is, which is excellent. Thank you. Yeah. He's, he's not nice. <laughs> I, no. I have also written down Poseidon is delicious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> But just something about that three-word combo really got me going. <laughs> I was like, yeah. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> I, I really love playing with the, with the different gods. And in this book, I have uh, I have several. So it starts off with like Hermes and Apollo and Hera's and theirs as well. And as I go through my series, I'm doing more of the gods. And I, I think my favorite is Ares just because he's so brutal and his savagery is oh i i, I love the villains so <laughs> um i am having That's a lot of good. fun <laughs> I, i'm I, gonna need yeah. to know if my, my man dionysus is ever turning up oh because... yeah yeah oh, <laughs> oh my god wine and theater what a lad <laughs> <laughs> he's got a little stall in the second one but he hasn't made a grand entrance yet <laughs> <laughs> cascade of wine that's what we need um, mm-hmm. <laughs> Zeus as a villain is is fundamentally quite scary as well. You know his ability to change his shape. It, yeah, yeah. It, there's there's something sort of primeval about not wanting to mess with something that can do that. Um, yeah. yeah, and he's he's you know the most powerful god out of in in all Greek mythology. You know it's always said you know do not offend Zeus, but yet these nymphs their their main mission is to kill him and. You, know, you can't kill an immortal, so it, it comes into this: how how do we do it? Like he has to yeah. be stopped, and the rules don't apply to him. So he's just this manipulative creature who is very animalistic in his primal desires, and he has to be stopped. And of course, the, the first time we, you know, the, the the way that Zeus's story starts is with him killing his father. Yep. So it, it it does you know it it leads it leans right into the way that you've gone with the with the novel and the the storytelling of the myth. Uh, it it sounds like it's it's going to really work and it and it, it, it and it did work then really well. It's Thank you. <laughs> mm. I, th- um, I believe the mantle does fall to you now, Ben. You must kill your father and <laughs> take your place as the next teller of the story. I just, I, I actually can't get Piggy Wiggy Woo out of my head. <laughs> That's such a Time problem. to read a story, Piggy Wiggy Woo. <laughs> oh, oh, no. <laughs> you know I'm going to phone you just at all hours now. <laughs> we, <laughs> do that. we need to start constructing a soundboard <laughs> to play. And that can be one of the first things. Oh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. So this is for The Hunted. Let's give it a go. The Hunted. I couldn't shake the feeling that it was all going to be okay. That feeling welled up in me sometimes, and the reassuring internal patter of positivity and platitudes always left a smile on my face. The photographs of the headless corpses were a collage of bruises and blood splatters on my desk. The picture of the mind behind them was clear, but I hadn't seen it yet. The victims had nothing overtly linking them, beyond their wealthy lifestyles. And the cops were stubbing their toes, kicking over barren rocks. That's why the families put me on retainer. The bodies were in bad shape. The killer had worked on them, something fierce, and with something heavy, before removing their heads. Leads were turning up nothing, and I found myself retreading ground the cops had already stood on in the early days of the investigation. People don't take too kindly to repeated prodding about serial murders, but I often found that they do respond well to a cheery attitude and a warm smile. Even with that, I was running out of time to find this killer before he struck again. The last prospect to link the victims came to me by chance as I looked over their files and saw a pattern of dates emerge. Each of them had changed jobs a month before their deaths and all had gone through the same agency downtown. 
I had a good feeling that I'd spotted something the police had missed and cheerfully expected to shine some light on the case. I decided to walk there rather than hail a cab. The rain that was a fixture of the season had burst the gutters and fell in ricocheting sheets between the skyscraping buildings of the city centre. I was cold and wet, my coat and hat having barely done their job, but I satisfied myself by thinking of how green the city would be in a few months. My destination was an older scraper, some vestige of a bygone era. The intricate edifice was even decorated with a few partially eroded gargoyles. I marvelled at humanity's ability to build something so tall as I stepped under the cover of the stone lintel to study the buzzer. A tower of brass plaques was screwed to the wall by it. I counted 15 businesses operating out of the building. I pressed number 12, Moore and Shaw Recruitment Services. The receptionist had a southern twang, and I sweet-talked my way into the building with stories of my time in Atlanta. Mr Moore himself was waiting with a handshake when I stepped out of the elevator. He was well-built and tall, every inch the smooth and strong businessman you see in high-end car ads. Detective, happy to meet you. The name's Marshall Moore. My partner retired last year, but we kept the name. Brand identity, you know. I shook his hand, holding it warmly in both mine. Might we step into your office, Mr Moore? I replied, and followed his lead over the lush red carpet. His office smelt of sandalwood, a curiously pervasive scent that lingered in a friendly way. I got the sense that he turned sour if I requested an ashtray, so I got straight to business. I have high hopes you'll be able to help me in my investigation. That's quite an outlook for a gumshoe. Aren't your type all expecting the worst out then? He nodded to the floor-to-ceiling window that made up the outer wall of his office. My doctor thinks it will kill me faster than the booze and the smokes combined, I chuckled. I can see how it would be fatal. Might you consider a new career? I'm sure I could find a place for that mind of yours. Is that what you do for your clients? How about for... I consulted my notebook and read out the long list of victims. In a way, yes. I... Well, I believe that to say that someone's job is vital to their happiness is an unforgivable understatement. My own father was a plumber, that being the trade picked out for him by his father. Moore indicated a gold-plated plumber's wrench that sat in a display bracket on his desk, then continued. But he got no worth or sense of accomplishment from the role. Brutally unhappy men become brutal to those around them. For all those poor people on your list, detective, I found them not just the job, but fulfilment. I nodded, thinking of all the jobs in these fine downtown buildings, that perhaps his was amongst the most worthy. Yet something niggled at me. Poor people. Poor people? What's that, detective? Moore had walked over to his desk and spoke to me over his shoulder. It's just I didn't mention what happened to them. Well, it's fairly safe to assume when a gumshoe asks you about some people that something bad must have happened. The one eye of his I could see shone with a transfixing glint. Right, right. You're a recruiter, yes, for all these big companies? I waved my hand towards the window. Yes, he smiled. His teeth, so many of them on display, shone like pearls. Isn't another word for that, a uh, headhunter? I felt the words trip out of my mouth, fully formed, before I'd had the chance to think about them. Moore spun on his heel and lashed out with a gold-plated plumber's wrench. It crunched into my skull, narrowly missing my temple. The lights dimmed for me, and I pitched sideways and fell to one knee, barely holding on to my consciousness. The happy glamour of the world seemed to shear away from my eyes, like a snake writhing clear of old skin. The realisation of the depraved darkness of the city beyond that rain-pasted window hit me harder than the yuppie's gilded tool. I've no need for your clever head, he yelled. You aren't happy! He swung down at me, and I raised my left arm to defend the blow. The heavy metal dented the bones in my forearm, and I felt the fracture spiral up into my elbow. I pulled the colt I kept strapped to my ankle and blew his knee out. The gunshot nearly deafened me, and I heard a high-pitched squeal in my ears as he wobbled about on his ruined leg for a moment before crashing into the glass of his window. It shattered, and Moore somehow caught the shard-studded frame before falling. The downtown rain ripped into the room in gusts, and his orderly office was thrown into damp chaos. I stepped forwards, levelling the colt at him. 
How else was I going to prove that I'd done a good job? His words were calm, almost like he was pointing out the obvious. He'd knocked the sheen from my world and left me with only the crushing darkness of my reality. All the sleaze, the violence, and the filth of the world weighed on me. I thought of the people he had helped, only to then sadistically help himself. I squeezed the trigger and limped back out past the hysterical secretary into the elevator. The caterwauling of sirens cut through the city noise as I went to find a drink and maybe a dame to brighten the world again, if only for a moment. There we are. You need any oh. more moody for that story, my man? Mm. <laughs> Get some powerful noir vibes. Yeah, that was where I was swinging. Um, but with like a bit of a twist to it that he's like a happy, optimistic dude at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think that's what I think that's what really sold it. There's a little phrase you had at the end about having the sheen knocked off of his world. Yeah. yeah. And that I did, I just plunged so hard and fast from there into like full noir. I d- that I came out feeling like it had always been there. But yeah, you then pointing it out, I was like Oh, oh man! <laughs> I just watched a guy break. That's wicked. I I thought it was just it was so just I, I guess personal because of being in that you know killer's just psyche and he you know he didn't think he was doing anything wrong. He was helping these people. It's like yeah, they're not happy. Like I, I'll I'll cure them. And then I loved that. He was just going to kill the detective just on full display in front of that grand window, secretary right outside, just the sense of righteousness that he felt and the entitlement that I, I, I don't care. I'm above all these, the consequences and the law. I, 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 I thought that was really powerful. Mm. Lots of nice descriptions of the city as well. I think you've yes. got to when you're going... When you go in Gumshoe, um, yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. It, it it was a bit odd when I was writing it. Like this, um, I got I, I got really carried away with this concept that I was going to try and inject optimism into a genre that is specifically full of cynicism and futilism. Yeah, um, and uh, like in all honesty, I'm not sure it works. <laughs> um, but <gasps> I had quite a lot. I had quite a lot of fun doing it, and I wanted to show the the descent into what is a fairly normal noir psyche by the end. I think it, I think it does work, especially when you lean into the right elements of it. Like, as you say, you have to describe the city because in mm-hmm. noir stories, generally the man and the city are intertwined. You, you can't separate them. Where does one end and the other begins? And him looking up at these old buildings with gar- crumbled gargoyles on them and saying, oh, you know, isn't it amazing what we can achieve? And then at the end, when you look back, that is just, it's just run down. It's broken. It doesn't work right anymore. Mm-hmm. It, it does, it does create the right parallel. And it's, it's being able to look through that character's lens that you did pull off, you know, putting that. It's only through looking at it through my own lovely nihilistic eyes that <laughs> I can say, well, that, that's what that really is. And it, yeah, I think, I think you did make it work. Mm. I also loved your use of color and how you kept saying like with, with the you know it'll be it's going to be green soon and that provoked and like the first thing you said you know it's going to be okay because we associate you know happiness with with the greenery with summer and that's you know leads into you know all the people with that you know seasonal affective disorder and how everything when it's like winter and dark and that gray like you you just become lost in this chaotic swirl where you're just clamoring to survive until you know that that green and that color comes back so i thought you did a really great job with mentioning the color and and you know like with the lush carpet how you said embellishing Mm. those finer details i thought that was great also just to keep tradition we both used the word caterwauling Ah, i picked up on that really (laughs) specific is that we 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 always have a connection somewhere yeah. in our stories. We don't know why it happens. Uh, we do not get together and confer on this, but caterwauling <laughs> is a really interesting word 
for us to have both used. Me right at the top of the story and you right at the bottom. Yeah, last sentence. How interesting. It must have something to do with the, the nature of the prompt in this case. Like, the hunted implies prey. Yeah. And I and it's, you know, perhaps there are only so many noises that prey can make. <laughs> That's doubly interesting. It does imply prey, but in both cases of ours, you know, cops are the, they are the predators. So, you know, for it to be police sirens catawalling, and for me it was the, the hunting posho who yes, was catawalling. True. So we both had it from a predator yeah, as, a, as a warning noise. Yeah, it's it's almost like they don't. It doesn't matter how much noise they make because they, they're coming anyway. They're getting you, yeah. 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 Oh, Those are great. Fun. <laughs> uh, no, I'm, uh, I had I had a lot of fun with that. Um, I like I do like to play with genre a bit. Um, so I'm I'm glad that that landed a bit. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Tiny Bookcase. Remember to subscribe, otherwise you're going to miss out on the future fun. Also, tell a friend if you like this episode. Link them to it. We'd be tremendously grateful. You can follow us on Twitter at Bookcase Tiny, Facebook at The Tiny Bookcase, and Instagram at Bookcase Tiny for updates. Speaking of supporting the podcast, well, magic can only take one so far. The Tiny Bookcase is supported by the generosity of its patrons. Those kind souls have really kept my belly full the last year. Let's cast a spell for them, shall we? For uh, Magnificent Beardery, let's cast the Chinicus Folliculale spell on Gary Laird. For Rich Ginger Tones on the scalp, let us cast the Orangi Hedondo spell for Scott Byrne. And for General Fabulousness, why not the Ulala la la How's Your Mother spell on Matthew McLaren? How do you come up with that shit, man?